On page 18 of your workbook, I talk about a step-by-step -step approach to 12-lead ECT interpretation. And this is so important for any diagnostic tool, whether it's cardiac rhythm interpretation or whether it's 12 leads or x-ray interpretation or blood gas interpretation. No matter what the diagnostic tool, it's important to take a step-by-step -step approach. And um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the um, steps in this presentation, and then we'll talk about the others in, in separate presentations. I want to talk about um, heart rate and rhythm, and we'll talk about ischemia, injury, and infarction separately because that's so important. <clears throat> but um, just as I mentioned in the one of the previous presentations when we looked at um, individual leads and what they look at, and it's important to look at them one sort of step at a time, um, when we look at the ECD overall, it's important to look at these steps individually as well and do that consistently, and that uh, ensures a greater chance that we'll make an accurate interpretation. So um, later on in some uh, later presentations, I'll also talk about hypertrophy and conduction defects such as bundle branch blocks. I'm not going to talk about axis calculation because uh, the focus of this um, workbook is on recognition of acute myocardial infarction. And axis deviation is not that critical for myocardial infarct, but it does become more important for uh, as sort of uh, supplementary evidence for certain things like hypertrophy and um, certain cardiac defects and so on and so forth. Um, but there is a section on axis calculation in the back of your book, so you can look at that. I call that FYBO. That that stands for for your brain only. And um, <clears throat> I encourage people to um, purchase. Uh, you know, a textbook to read up on more uh, detailed information about 12 lead ECT if, if this is something that really interests you because there's a lot of information that you can glean from a 12 lead that uh, I'm not going to talk about in this workbook, um, but some interesting information nonetheless. So we'll begin with rate. Now, um, in the pre-hospital setting, uh, you know, we typically hook a patient up to the monitor right away and check for a pulse right away to determine whether the heart rate is in the normal range or whether it's fast or slow. And if it's too fast or too slow, that could be a problem. And certainly, if we have a patient who's unwell uh, or hemodynamically unstable, if the heart rate's too fast or too slow, that could be the cause or could be a co contributor. If that's not the case, <clears throat> then we have to look for other potential causes, such as volume depletion, as in hypovolemia or uh, severe dehydration resulting in volume depletion or uh, significant burns resulting in volume depletion. Um, if that's not the case, we may be looking at a pump problem. And um, that could be left ventricular failure, so we look for signs like pulmonary edema and hypotension, or if we're dealing with acute right ventricular failure, we may be dealing with someone who is hypotensive, bradycardic, but has a clear chest and JVD. Is it a tank problem? For example, uh, patients who have significant vasodilation as a result of anaphylaxis or um, neurogenic shock, or is it some kind of obstructive uh, shock such as uh, tension pneumothorax, which uh, compresses the inferior vena cava and reduces venous return to the heart? Uh, so if, if the heart rate is not the problem, then we have to look at some of these other potential causes. When it comes to uh, rhythm interpretation, this is critically important really for determining uh, whether there's an intervention required, such as a pharmacological intervention, i.e. administration of an antiarrhythmic, or if electrical therapy is required for a patient who has um, a heart rate that's too fast or too slow that requires either cardioversion or external cardiac pacing. 